Hello guys, in my first movie analysis I chose to talk about one of my favorite movies, the 1987 classic Full Metal Jacket Directed by Stanley Kubrick based on the semi-autobiographical novel The Short Timers written by US Marine Corps veteran Gustav Hasfeld. Since 1987 a lot of people have made analyses trying to understand Full Metal Jacket but I don't think I have ever seen a red one that goes towards the same direction I am going with this video. I think we should change the direction. Now of course interpretation of art is always somewhat subjective and I say somewhat because subjectivity of interpretation is limited. I mean you can't just make up an interpretation that simply doesn't fit the information given in the story. Maybe the cabin is the place inside each of us created by our goodwill and teamwork. Ma. They said to be sandwiches. If a particular interpretation of a movie, book, play, etc. provides a cohesive explanation of the information exposed in the narrative, then that is a good interpretation. And a narrative with so much subtext and context like Full Metal Jackets allow the audience to have multiple good interpretations, which is usually a sign of a well-written story. This is all to say that despite having a different understanding of this movie than most people, it doesn't mean that other interpretations are necessarily wrong. One of the most common interpretations of Full Metal Jacket is that this movie isn't about denouncing the cruelty of American soldiers in the US Vietnam War in particular, but that it denounces the cruelty of war in general, which makes it an anti-war movie. In the second part of Full Metal Jacket, we see US soldiers committing brutal, senseless murder of Vietnamese civilians, some of which are completely gratuitous. How can you shoot women, children? The madness of war and how human life is completely devaluated when extreme violence becomes normalized are certainly important themes in Full Metal Jacket, but I think there is something else that a lot of people miss. The quintessential movie about madness and senseless violence in war is Apocalypse Now, directed by Francis Ford Coppola and also set in the US Vietnam War. Apocalypse Now is about a rogue colonel acting on his own, recruiting his own men and killing people on both sides of the conflict. The fascinating thing about Apocalypse Now is that it could be set in any war. With few adaptations, it would be perfectly possible to make a film about a high-ranking US officer going rogue in World War II, recruiting his own men and killing people from all sides of that conflict. But I do not think you can do that with Full Metal Jacket, for one very important difference between the US military campaign against North Vietnam and their campaign against Nazi Germany. The latter was morally justified. The US military went to Europe to help the liberation of the countries occupied by the monstrous Nazi regime, so there is no question that in that war US troops were a force for good. As violent, maddening and horrible as war is, the US military campaign against the Nazis was righteous. The Nazis had to be stopped. Nazi ain't got no humanity. They're the foot soldiers of a Jew-hating, mass-murdering maniac and they need to be destroyed. That doesn't mean that American soldiers in Europe during World War II didn't commit atrocities against the civilian population. But even these horrible cases pale in comparison to the horrors committed by the Nazis. Historically, we see them as blemishes on the American military campaign in World War II, but that don't change the fact that the primary goal of that mission was righteous. If a filmmaker were to make a movie about American American soldiers committing atrocities against civilians while fighting Nazis in World War II, it would have to be a much different film from Full Metal Jacket. Otherwise they would be certainly accused of downplaying the horrors of Nazism and rightfully so. You see, every choice a filmmaker makes when telling a story, especially one that is set during a historical event, carries a lot of political implications. In Full Metal Jacket, the American military as an institution are the villains. In Act 1, we see how the military creates the beasts unleashed in Act 2. If one were to make a movie about Americans in World War II, just like Full Metal Jacket, they would by consequence diminish the crimes of the Nazis. Because any narrative set in a historical event has a lot of context that the author must consider. My point with all this is that to say Full Metal Jacket is an anti-war movie in general is only partially correct. There are always horror in wars, but the American war against Nazi Germany was necessary. 
it did have a righteous purpose. The American war against North Vietnam and the Viet Cong did not. In Vietnam, Americans were the foreign invaders committing atrocities against the local population that wasn't very happy to see them there. I mean, many Vietnamese did join the Viet Cong, especially in the countryside. A movie like Full Metal Jacket, in the perspective of a Nazi soldier watching his brothers in arms committing unspeakable acts of violence against the local civilian population would be very effective. The same movie, in the perspective of an American soldier in Europe would not. And noting this fundamental difference between the role of the American military in these two different wars, this political context, is essential to understand Full Metal Jacket not only as an anti-war movie, but primarily as an anti-imperialist movie. Okay, you might not be buying this idea yet, but at least allow me to make my case first. Because I do expect that by the end of this video, I'll motivate you to go and rewatch Full Metal Jacket with this fresh perspective. I will motivate you, Private Pyle, if it short dicks every cannibal on the Congo! Just a little disclaimer before I proceed, I'll give major spoilers to Full Metal Jacket, so I strongly recommend that you go watch the movie before watching this video if you haven't done that yet. I don't want to get too technical in this analysis, but there are some important things about the technical aspects of this movie that I want to discuss. The narrative of Full Metal Jacket is divided in two parts. The first one in Paris Island Depot, USA, where the marine recruits are being trained to fight in Vietnam, and the second part in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive in 1968. Each part can be broken down into three acts. There is a setup of the conflict, the confrontation, and the resolution. So despite the seemingly unusual structure of Full Metal Jacket, the film actually follows a simple three-act structure divided into different parts, which make it a six-act structure. What is most unusual about this movie is the sudden drastic change of tone between the end of part one and the beginning of part two. Part one ends with a very shocking scene that leaves the audience stupefied. No! And before we can even process what we just saw, we get a jovial scene in the streets of Da Nang with Private Joker, the main character played by Matthew Modine. You got girlfriend, Vietnam? Not just this minute. It's a very daring choice by Stanley Kubrick that doesn't really please everyone, but honestly, making daring choices is pretty much what made Kubrick a great filmmaker to begin with. Now, the first part of the movie, Boot Camp, is arguably the most memorable. It gives a very crude depiction of the training recruits get, and it's often praised by its accurate portrayal of life in boot camp, its unique cinematography, and the acting, especially from actors Arlie Ermey and Vincent D'Onofrio. Oh After the iconic opening credit scene with John Wright's song Hello Vietnam, we are introduced to the drill instructor Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, played by Arlie Army. Army was a former drill instructor himself and brought a lot of authenticity to his character, even improvising many lines. By the way, if like myself, English is not your first language, you can learn a number of hilarious, creative insults watching Army's performance in this film. How tall are you, Private? Sir, five foot nine, sir! Five foot nine, I didn't know they stacked shit that high! Just stay away of the racist stuff, though. There is no racial bigotry here. I do not look down on <laughs> Here you are all equally worthless. The drill instructor's job is simple, but not easy, to turn this group of typical young American men into killers. And right from the beginning, he states clearly why he's such a hard ass. Because I am hard, you will not like me! But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. Now, from the purely institutional point of view, all the abuse these recruits are submitted to is necessary. Because if they are dropped in Vietnam on their first patrol and are not ready to kill without hesitation, they would be KIA when facing a determined enemy. If your killer instincts are not clean and strong, you will not kill. You will become dead, Marine. A fascinating thing about the bootcamp sequence is how real veterans usually love it. In fact, I only read one article from a veteran that doesn't like it. As a civilian, I would think that veterans wouldn't be pleased revisiting the abuse they endured as recruits, but they are often proud of the fact that they made through all that. And this reaction from veterans is, in my opinion, a great 
clue why most civilians usually don't really understand the bootcamp sequence. The most common thing I see in analyses and reviews of Full Metal Jacket is that this movie depicts how military training dehumanizes young men and takes away their individuality, but I don't think that's the case. What the film actually shows is that the abuse by the drill instructor serves a purpose, which is to harden these young men and turn them into killers. The dehumanization of the recruit is the main motivation for him to prove to the drill instructor and his platoon that he is worth of wearing the marines uniform. The marines, the soldiers, are not dehumanized, on the contrary, they are agents of God, angels of death, they are everything you want to be. But to become a marine you have to earn it, you have to pass the test, and until you do, you are nothing. If you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training, you will be a weapon, but until that day, you are pukes. So the training is not really about dehumanizing the soldiers. It's not about taking away their individuality so they can blindly follow orders like robots. The training is about hardening them through discipline and making them proud of overcoming this test and calling themselves Marines at the end. Private Joker even states that clearly in the movie. The Marine Corps does not want robots. The Marine Corps wants killers. The Marine Corps wants to build indestructible men, men without fear. By looking at the bootcamp sequence through this perspective, you find nothing inherently anti-war or anti-military about it, and it explains why so many Marines enjoy it. Military service requires discipline and that you follow orders in the battlefield, because if you don't, you will disrupt the strategy and your friends will die as a result of your insubordination. Now, I am a chef, I work in busy kitchens. We are not fighting for our lives like soldiers, but our work also requires discipline. If one chef in a team decides to not follow the head chef's orders, the meal isn't prepared properly and the team fails to achieve its goal. Where's the land source? It's somewhat analogous to the military, but of course the stakes are much higher in a battlefield, but that is the reason why discipline is so important to the military. It's not about taking away the soldier's individuality, it's about not panicking under fire and be able to carry out the orders of your commanding officer without hesitation, no matter how difficult your goal is, because if you don't do your job, you will break the line, you will disrupt the strategy, and your team will lose the battle, and your friends will die. To solidify my point, there is a scene where the drill instructor asks Private Joker if he believes in the Virgin Mary. Private Joker, do you believe in the Virgin Mary? Sir, no, sir! And after Joker says no, the drill instructor slaps him and tells him to change his mind, which Joker refuses to do. Sir, the Private believes that any answer he gives will be wrong! And the senior drill instructor will beat him harder if he reverses himself, sir! As a result of standing up for his beliefs, Joker is actually promoted to squad leader. Who's your squad leader, scumbag? Sir, the private squad leader is Private Snowball, sir! Private Snowball, you're fired! Private Joker is promoted to squad leader! The military not only needs grunts who blindly follow orders, but also men with wits, men who can lead others in the battlefield and inspire them. Of course, even a leader within the military is bound to the rigid hierarchy and codes of conduct, but then again, the discipline is a demand of military work. And as long as there is a military, this structure is not going to change much because it is effective to the job. Now, where the military training seemed to fail in Full Metal Jacket is with recruit Leonard Lawrence, also known as Private Gomer Pyle. Lawrence is obese and has a very low IQ, making it difficult difficult for him to adjust to military training. And remember, these men are being prepared to fight in an extremely hostile territory. They have to be extraordinarily fit physically and mentally to deal with what they will face in a battlefield and Lawrence is clearly unfit. There is uh, this scene where the recruits are running and have to literally carry him along the way. He's a liability to the squad and it seems to me that the sensible thing to do here would be to discharge him as unfit for duty. But at that time, the US military needed every man they could get their hands on and if a man like Private Pio couldn't graduate in this regiment, he would simply have to try again in the next. Also, discharging someone as unfit could encourage other recruits to just slack off to get discharged as well. So again, from the perspective of the institution, considering that the US was in the middle of a war, the way Private Pio is treated makes sense. Now, when punishing Private Pio directly was not working, the drill instructor decided to punish the platoon instead, to incite them to turn on Private Pio. From now on, whenever Private Pyle fucks up, 
I will punish all of you! And the beat-up that Lawrence received from his squad mates as a result of that, as cruel as it was, <laughs> works. I mean, he did start to obey orders and becomes hardened after that. Private Powell, you are definitely born again hard. Enough to even graduate at the end. Cover Powell! All 300 infantry, you made it! The problem, of course, is that he was not capable of challenging his hatred towards the enemy, the Vietnamese, and instead discharges his weapon on his drill instructor. But he was able to kill, which was kind of a success. I mean, in the novel, before dying, Hartman actually says to Private Pyle, I am proud of you, a line that was omitted in the film. But, on the other hand, from the institutional point of view, the training of Private Pyle was a complete failure. He killed his drill instructor and then killed himself without ever firing his weapon against the enemy. But that was the price the military paid for their excessively cruel methods. But the movie leaves it up to the audience to decide whether the institution was at fault for that tragedy or if the fault was entirely on the drill instructor, since Hartman Hartman was in fact much more over the top than the average drill instructor. And finally, going back to a point that I made earlier, the recruits who went to World War II to kill Nazis went through the same brutish training. Come on ladies, Fire, pick it up, move it, move on. it, I want to see some fire here! This is what it takes to make a man capable of doing this job. If you are not a psychopath, killing another human being is probably the hardest thing a person can do. It's a hell of a thing killing a man. You take away all he's got and all he's ever gonna have. I only killed one human being in Vietnam, and that was the first man that I ever killed. I was sick with guilt about killing that guy and thinking I'm going to have to do this for the next 13 months, I'm going to go crazy. And I saw a Marine step on a bouncing Betty mine, and that's when I made my deal with the devil in that I said I will never kill another human being as long as I'm in Vietnam. However. I will waste as many gooks as I can find. I'll wax as many dinks as I can find. I'll smoke as many zips as I can find. But I ain't gonna kill anybody. You know, you turn a subject into an object. It's racism 101. And it turns out to be a very necessary tool when you have children fighting your wars. So whether you believe the bootcamp sequence is anti or pro-military depends entirely on your view whether a military force should or should not exist in the first place. While the first part of the film had the main character, Private Joker, acting more as an active observant, the main focus of that sequence is Private Lawrence's transition from goofball into a killer, the second part focuses on Private Joker's transition from happy-go-lucky combat correspondent into a killer. And independently on how you feel about the bootcamp sequence, since there are different ways of interpreting it, the second part of the film is unquestionably satirical and anti-war, or in my view anti-imperialist. Right after the first scene in Vietnam where Joker and his friend Rafterman have their camera stolen by a Vietnamese man, the two marines have a very revealing conversation. You know what really pisses me off about these people? We're supposed to be helping them and they shit all over us every chance they get. Take it too hard, Rafterman. It's just business. It was common for American soldiers in Vietnam to be surprised at the fact that the Vietnamese people in general didn't seem to appreciate their presence in the country. Soldiers were told by their command that they were going to liberate Vietnam from the tyranny of the communists in the north, but of course the US was itself supporting a tyrannic government in the south. The Vietnamese people had already been through a long war with France and liberated themselves from a foreign invader years earlier. Many Vietnamese saw the Americans as just another imperialist power wanting to wage war in Vietnam for their own strategic needs, not really to help the Vietnamese people. And of course they were right. After all, the US has sided with the French colonizers during the first in the China war, and being a well-read guy, Joker was certainly aware of that, which explained his nonchalant attitude towards unsympathetic Vietnamese. Joker understands that the war wasn't about exporting American virtues, as the idealist Rafterman believes. It was just business. American soldiers were being lied to by their commanders and military correspondents like Joker had the job to perpetuate the bullshit. The scene in the newsroom shows that the editor would even order the correspondents to fabricate positive news about the war. Joker, where's the weenie? Sir? The kill, Joker, the kill. I mean, all that fire, the grunts must have hit something. Didn't see him. 
Now, you must have seen blood trails. It was raining, sir. Now, rewrite it and give it a happy ending. Say, uh, one kill. After the NVA and the Viet Cong launched the Tet Offensive, Joker and Raftermen are ordered to go to cover the situation in the city of Hue, one of the most intense battles of the entire US-Vietnam War. On their way there, they meet the door gunner, the psychotic man operating a helicopter machine gun, killing civilians indiscriminately. Anyone who runs is a VC! Anyone who stands still is a well-disciplined VC! Men capable of doing what the dog gunner is doing here are psychopaths. But the paranoia among US soldiers was true. They couldn't in fact tell who was and who wasn't a Viet Cong, and that paranoia led many to commit unspeakable acts of violence against the civilian population of South Vietnam, from raping and murdering to burning down entire villages, which was depicted in the 1986 film Platoon, directed by Oliver Stone. Right after the dog gunner scene, we also see cruelty from the Vietnamese. Joker visits one of the many mass graves where the Viet Cong buried South Vietnamese people executed for collaborating with the USA, including women and children. The dead have been covered with lime. The dead know only one thing. It is better to be alive. Now, throughout the film, Joker is wearing a peace symbol on his uniform while his helmet says born to kill. This flagrant irony catches the attention of a nearby colonel who confronts Joker for his fashion choice. You write born to kill on your helmet and you wear a peace button. What's that supposed to be, some kind of sick joke? Joker responds that he's making a point about the duality of man, that to achieve peace, one must kill, which echoes what the Marines teach during basic training. My rifle and myself are defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. So be it, until there is no enemy, but peace. Baffled, the colonel proceeds to lecture Joker about discipline and then delivers that which is my favorite line in the entire film. We are here to help the Vietnamese because inside every gook there is an American trying to get out. It's a hardball world, son. We've got to try to keep our heads until this peace craze blows over. Okay, there is a lot to unpack here. First, I think the big irony in this scene is that right after seeing the dog gunner kill a bunch of civilians, we see the Vietnamese also committing atrocities. The implicit dark humor here is that the pile of dead civilians in the background is indeed an indication that there is an American trying to get out from inside the Vietnamese, even though that doesn't really mean what the colonel is trying to imply here. Then of course there is the fact that the colonel is not annoyed by Joker writing Born to Kill in his helmet, he's annoyed by the peace symbol. It is the peace symbol that makes the colonel question Joker's loyalty, and the colonel and his reprimand referring to peace as a craze, since in this hardball world, war is a natural state of things. And again, that comes back to basic training and the brainwashing that marines receive. The marines' life's mission is to wage war, to kill the enemy, and until there are enemies to kill, there is no peace. Peace is only achieved when the enemy is dead. Finally, there is the mission of saving the Vietnamese, which is an expression of the manifest destiny, the idea that Americans have the duty to spread American values throughout the world. In that view, whenever America wages war against another country, it is to export their quote-unquote superior values, which makes it in fact a humanitarian act, which again is the duality of killing to spread peace and freedom. The manifest destiny is considered by many historians as the ultimate expression of American imperialism, the imposition of American values across the world through conquest and warfare, not diplomacy and soft power. Many historians believe that the manifest destiny and American supremacy, which seem ever-present in American foreign policy, are the ideologies that justify US interventionism worldwide. After this scene, we meet the Lost Hawk Squad, which includes Private Cowboy, who went to boot camp with Joe and with whom Joker and Rafterman will spend the rest of the film with. In this scene, we see that the men in the front line developed some sinister coping mechanisms to deal with the trauma and anxiety of war. This is my bro. But since this is not a typical war movie, the upbeat song Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs plays along, which gives this disturbing scene a dark comedic tone. After the first battle scene, we have three key scenes that tell us more about these characters and their views on the American role in the war and their Vietnamese allies. The first one happens right after the battle, where squad members are saying their goodbyes to fallen soldiers' handjob and touchdown. When Rafterman says the soldiers died fighting for freedom, squad member enemy my mother has this reaction. You think we waste gooks for freedom? 
This is a slaughter. The second key scene is the soldiers' interviews, where once again we see the cynicism in regards to the American role in the war. Can I quote LBJ? I will not send American boys to do a job that Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. They took away our freedom and gave it to the, to the gookers, you know. They don't want it. They'd rather be alive than free, I guess. You know. Poor dumb bastards. <laughs> what Eight Ball is referring to here is the fact that many soldiers were conscripted to fight on this war, and he could possibly be referring to racism in America as well. As we've seen earlier, many American soldiers were baffled that the majority of South Vietnamese people did not greet them as the saviors and freedom fighters they believed themselves to be. I mean, we're getting killed for these people and they don't even appreciate it. They think it's a big joke. The best of all interviews, however, is Jokers, which in my opinion perfectly encapsulates the anti-imperialist message of this film. Note how he refers to an ancient culture, which serves to highlight the arrogance of the American mindset. I wanted to see exotic Vietnam. I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. The third key scene is when a South Vietnamese soldier pimps a prostitute to the squad, which shows how many South Vietnamese saw Americans just as an opportunity to make easy money. Ten dollars. Five dollars. Be glad to trade you some Arvin rifles. And never been fired and only dropped once. <laughs> and when Cowboy says RVN rifles that had only been dropped once, he's referring to the reputation of South Vietnamese troops to quickly retreat in the fire. I believe that the major point of these scenes is to show that there wasn't mutual respect between American and South Vietnamese troops. Americans saw the South Vietnamese as ungrateful, and the South Vietnamese saw the Americans as arrogant. Then finally we proceed to the final act, set during a patrol in a devastated city of Huey. After squad leader Crazy Earl dies in a booby trap, now Sergeant Cowboy is promoted to squad leader. Cowboy is clearly unprepared to take the leadership role and eventually get his squad lost. We're here? Yeah. We should be here? Yeah, yeah, that's right. After Corporal Eightball is hit by a Vietnamese sniper numerous times, the corpsman of the squad, Doc J, goes after him to help, but he ends up getting shot too. Lost, without backup, and with no knowledge of the enemy's position, Cowboy decides to move forward and leave Eightball and Doc J behind, which enrages private animal mother, Eightball's best friend. Fuck you, Cowboy! Fuck all you assholes! Before dying, Doc J is able to point to the position of the sniper, allowing the squad to take cover while planning an attack. However, Cowboy doesn't pay attention to the sniper's position while calling the radio for backup and ends up getting shot and dying on Joker's arms. After losing their best friends to the sniper, Joker and Animal Mother are determined to kill them. Let's go get some payback. Okay. Using smoke and debris as cover, they are able to flank the sniper, and when Joker finally gets a clear shot at the Vietnamese shooter, who is revealed to be a teenager girl in Viet Cong uniform, his rifle jams, leaving him in an extremely vulnerable position. However, Rafterman shoots the sniper before she is able to shoot Joker. Gasping for air in extreme pain, the Vietnamese woman begs to be executed. While Rafterman is in a complete frenzy after shooting her, Joker and Animal Mother discuss whether they should execute her or not. We can't just leave her here. If you want to waste her, go on. Waste her. With the same summer music from the scene where Private Pyle killed drill instructor Hartman, Joker executes the Vietnamese woman, turning himself into a killer. The film ends with a puzzling scene of American soldiers walking through the war-torn streets of Hue, singing the Mickey Mouse song, while Joker celebrates coming back home alive. I am so happy that I am alive, in one piece. Now I've seen many interpretations for this final scene. That this was another example of weird camaraderie between brothers in arms, that Mickey Mouse represents soldiers going back to their childhood, as Joker talks about coming home, as satire, referring to the Marines' uh, Mickey Mouse outfit, and many other interpretations. My interpretation, however, is that this is a symbol of what the American military achieved in this war. Earlier in the film, Joker said that his going to Vietnam was to meet fascinating people from an ancient culture and kill them. 
which he did. Now, Hue City, formerly known as Phu Xuan, was the former capital of Vietnam. It's a great symbol of Vietnamese culture due to its historical significance. While Disney's Mickey Mouse, alongside Coca-Cola or McDonald's, is a famous symbol of America's culture of consumerism and corporatism, and so might say, American cultural imperialism. So in this scene, we have American soldiers marching through the historic city of Hue going up in flames while happily singing the Mickey Mouse song with no Vietnamese joining them. The US military went to this distant land to supposedly bring American values to these people, but it didn't bother to learn anything about Vietnamese history or culture. They were there only to pursue their own selfish interests and forgot to consider that there was a nation with brave and resilient people who did not share their goals, and that was their home. And as a result of this arrogance, young American men killed thousands of Vietnamese people, burned their cities to the ground, only to sing the Mickey Mouse song by themselves in the rubble. Because the American leadership was wrong, the Vietnamese didn't want to become Americanized. The southern Vietnamese Vietnamese people didn't want to be ruled by communists, but that doesn't mean that they wanted to become Americans. These are two different things. And as I said earlier, this is vastly different from America's mission in World War II. Killing Nazis. This is why I believe that the message of this movie is that cultural imperialism and the imposition of your own values into a different culture by force is a destructive, evil, and ultimately fruitless endeavor. You will corrupt the youth of your country and bring death and destruction to another land and will achieve nothing in the end. And as history has shown decades later, America clearly didn't learn their lesson. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Well guys, thank you all for watching. As always, a huge thanks to my subscribers and a super special thanks to my patrons. I cannot thank you enough for your continuous support during these difficult times. Thank you so much. I've been Sarah Michelle. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.